Here's the deal. I've been blackballed. And I'm not leaving here tonight until I talk to somebody that's got the major stroke. Nitro is a two-hour show. I've got no plans. I'm planning to stay here all night. And one other thing. I got a message for my ex-WCW boss, Eric Bischoff. You can kiss my ass. <laughs> Hello, my name is Del Muir and welcome to the Wrestling 20 Years Ago podcast where we jump by the time machine in January of 1997 for Volume 2 of this month's show where we look at other than WCW. Uh, this is Volume 2, check out Volume 1 for WWF and other than from this year's Royal Rumble leading into WrestleMania and Volume 3 for ECW and the review of their TVs at the start of the year. As we say, this is Volume 2, two parts for the month, we've got Part 1 looking at from WCW, and that's involving Clash of the Champions 34, and we've also got a two-part this month looking at NWO's first pay-per-view, sold out. I am joined in this first part, firstly by the United Kingdom's leading Stuart Brooks impersonator and all-round fan of tenors, Mr Peter Kimber. Pete, hello. Evening, guys. How are we all right? And also Bob Bamber, the, the general podcast master of the Wrestling 20 Years Ago podcast. Bobby, hello. Good evening, Del. Uh, Happy New Year, boys. Happy New Year, everyone. Pete, if you could kick us off with the news, please. WCW set an all-time attendance record at the United Center in Chicago, drawing a sellout crowd for an episode of Monday Nitro of over 17,000 fans. While WCW have drawn a bigger gate in the past, largely down to hosting Halloween Havoc in Las Vegas last year, the show also did over $100,000 in merchandise sales. Fans in attendance witnessed arguably the best episode of Nitro to date including a Randy Savage sit-in, another typical brawl between the Taskmaster and Chris Benoit. Eric Bischoff also took the time to note that this would be the biggest crowd for a pro wrestling show this year in Chicago, a nod to WrestleMania being hosted in a smaller venue in the area. The first and quite possibly last NWO pay-per-view took place this month as NWO sold out outlined much of the worst about the group so far. The show produced in a way to distance themselves as far as they reasonably could from WCW, with WCW talent receiving no music, a unique unique three-screen video wall, and women sat on motorcycles around the ring participating in a Miss NWO contest. On the positive side, Eddie Guerrero and Six had an excellent ladder match, and the Steiners temporarily at least won the tag titles in the one match of the evening not fully refereed by Nick Patrick. Hulk Hogan and the Giant went to a no contest while there were wins to Masahiro Chono, Big Bubba, Jeff Jarrett, Marcus Bagwell and Scott Norton. Randy Savage returns to WCW this month for signing a $1 million per year contract working a limited number of dates. It said the primary reason for WCW retaining Savage was that the Slim Jim sponsorship deal alone is worth half of Savage's contract. The Macho Man's return happened on the January 20th as he hosted a sit-in to open up Nitro, only stopped when Sting came down to the ring and talked him into leaving. We haven't heard from Savage since, but he was spotted alongside Sting in the rafters on the final Nitro of the month. Four days prior to NWO sold out, WCW hosted their latest class of the Champions event featuring Dean Malenko defeating Ultimo Dragon for the WCW Cruiserweight title. The show, otherwise featured little of note with some enhancement matches and minimal build towards sold out show four days later. There were squash wins for Scotty Riggs, Harlem Heat and the Steiners, along with wins for Masahiro Chono, Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit and the trio's team of Chris Jericho, Super Calo and Chavo Guerrero Jr. In the main event, Lex Luger defeated Scott Hall by disqualification following interference from Kevin Nash and Six. Scott Hall missed two weeks with Nitro following an injury suffered at the hands of Jerry Sags. It's said that Sags reacted badly to Hall throwing a chair at him. Um, he unloaded on Hall, and Hall reportedly, though, thought it was part of a storyline. He let Sags, who at it managed to knock out one of his teeth in the process. Interesting, and his position in amongst this is Hulk Hogan, a long-time friend of Sags, but apparently also over the worst of any heat with Hall, stemming from a couple of months back. It's said that Nash had planned to confront them after a baseball bat, but nothing came of it. 
WCW's latest attempt at working the boys came at the hands of a bar scuffle between Chris Benoit and Kevin Sullivan, though it seems like most WCW's talents saw that for what it was. Eric Bischoff is reportedly learning how to, how to take bumps so he can sell for wrestlers during angles. UFC fighter Don Fry said in an interview with Texas Radio that he's been talking regularly to Ric Flair and is hoping to come in and work with the Four Horsemen. In an interview with Prodigy, Eric Bischoff said that he wasn't sure Shawn Michaels would even fit on WCW's roster, but was apparently very positive about Bret Hart. And in early numbers for Starkey, the Barrett put in in the 0.9 to 1.0 range, one of WCW's biggest ever. Quick reminder that we are on Patreon for five bucks a month. You can you know, say thank you and also get access to early shows like this where possible. Don't know if there's going to be any this month. Uh, but if you'd like to find out more about that, go to patreon.com forward slash wrestling 20 virus or visit links on the website and in the podcast description. Del, over to you for the rest. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, an article in tweet for WCW in the ratings front this month. Uh, ratings seemingly on the Follow the upward trend of many of their other metrics at the minute. Um, December 30th showed once again that they were much more immune to the, the holidays in WWF with Nitro down a 3.6 to Raw's 1.6. January 6th, Nitro down a 3.0. That was in comparison to Raw's 2.1. In January 13th, it was a 3.4 to Nitro, Raw 2.3. Um, any hopes that Royal Rumble might quell the Nitro run fell down as Nitro that a 3.7 to Raw's 2.2. Then the last week of the month, much the same, Raw doing a 2.2, and that was against Nitro with a 3.6. Less of the, the actual ratings themselves. I'll just hand back over to yourself, Bob, run us through the first couple of TVs for the month. As this thing has manifested itself here in recent weeks between you and Chris Benoit and woman... What are you trying to do, drive what? me crazy? I'm not you? Hey, everybody had a good year, huh? Well, I didn't have that good a year. I'm not trying to drive you crazy. I do have some videotape footage. I told I... you about seeing a videotape with Benoit and Nancy. I don't want to see any more of those tapes. That's personal. I-, I would like to see you and Benoit or whoever in World Championship Wrestling get your collective acts together and attack the real enemy, the NWO. Well, let me tell you something. Me and Benoit getting our acts together, there's something that separates me and Benoit. Benoit, you think you've won this game of chess? You said to me, checkmate. Benoit, this match has just started. I've put you in position to get checkmated. By the way, Kevin Sullivan, if I can point out, this this videotape that I have, this, this footage, is not of woman, Nancy as you know her, and Benoit. It's of somebody else. What are you talking about? I think you know what I'm talking about, don't you? You better not be. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Do you care to pursue it? But apparently not. That's the answer. Tony and uh, Larry, you guys, if you can figure it out, a very, very complex situation. Tony and Larry, welcome us to 1997. And Glacius introduced to face beautiful Bobby Eaton. Larry plays up Eaton's tag pass and Tony talks about Roddy Piper. Glacier dominates winning with a standing sidekick. We get a recap of Bubba Rogers and Conan from last week before they have a Mexican strap match. Conan crotches Bubba with the strap and hits three corners. Rogers hits him and rebounds him into the fourth for the win. Gene talks to Kevin Sullivan backstage him to get another party in the Benoit Sullivan woman triangle. Oakland then comes out to the stage with the horseman. Anderson, Flair and Deborah all nail their interviews as they discuss Chris and Nancy. Jarrett's out to find out if a horseman he will be. He offends Ian Anderson and gets the definitive beatdown for an answer. That snowballs into a makeshift match with Jarrett pinning Arn with his feet on the ropes and the horseman break down as Deborah defends Double J. Arn walks out and Flair and Jarrett strut. The NWO plug their pay-per-view and a paid-for vignette and Regal is out to defend his TV title against the no-show DDP, so out comes Hackshaw and Jim Duggan to steal a shot. Regal stalls to start and the NWO take to the desk. Bischoff tells us Paige is at dinner with Hall, Nash and Six, and they plug their Miss NWO contest. No fat chicks or heinous broads. Duggan has it won with a take this shot, but Regal is saved by the bell for a time limit draw. Hacks or hot dogs with a WCW flag as we go to our number two. Hugh Morris is out to ridiculously funky music to replace Jim Powers. Morris wins with a moonsault. Today and Heenan weigh in on the Horsemen's women problems and Psychosis and Rey Mysterio match up. Top ropes, cross bodies in the outside, Springfield sentons and even a Tijuana jam. 
Mysterio wins with a springboard Hurricane Rana sit down pin. Kevin Sullivan takes on Chavo Guerrero Jr. Taskmaster winning quickly. We see Piper being ambulanced out from last month. Alex Wright takes on Eddie Guerrero. Six appears, climbs a ladder, and mocks Eddie from the stage with the US title. Guerrero wins it with a frog splash and six legs it. Viva la Quebec! It's the amazing French Canadians with a savage O Canada before they face Harlem Heat. Carl goes out to flag Stevie but hits Jacques. Stevie Ray and Booker get the win and Legionnaire Parker promises to make them pay. Main event time we get Luger vs Meng. Lex looking to have the win with a torch rack but Barbarian comes out as the referee's down. The ref then bizarrely gives the win to Luger as he racks Meng's partner. The entire NWO flank the stage for the arrival of Hogan. Bischoff's interview with Hollywood gets cut short with the arrival of the Giant. He empties the ring, launching Patrick to the outside, but they beat him down. Bischoff then nails the Giant with a jumping roundhouse, spinning, standing side high kick. Thanks, Dell. The NWO take over the desk and Sting arrives, whispers to the Giant and points the bat at the NWO. He leaves the ring, drops the bat. Vince goes in for the strat, scraps, but gets chokeslammed and Giant bays the rest off with the bat. We get a hot open on January the 13th with Giant attacking the NWO's locker room, getting hunked out by, huckled out by security. Back in the arena, Chavo and JL start us off, Carrera getting a quick win with a standing moonsault. Duggan's out again with his WCW flag. Sting jumps in and hits his reverse DDT that they're now calling the Scorpion Death Drop. Jericho squashes Pittman. Harlem Heat take on Rage and Chaos, but we again cut to Giant in the back, demanding his title shot, as again security have to drag him from the NWO locker room. In the ring, the Heat Seeker wins for Booker T and Stevie Ray. Shivoni tells us the Championship Committee are meeting about Hogan and Bischoff ducking Giant's challenge, and we see a very dark sting package on where he stands. He, they say he's theirs. Dallas Page goes up against Mark Starr. Bischoff calls a nice move for Page and he wins. It's the diamond cutter, Eric. Post-match, Nash and Page hug. He puts on the black and white, but cutters Hall and then launches Nash to the outside and leaves through the crowd. We'll discuss that in a minute. Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko face off. Shivoni gets his memo from the committee saying that Hogan must face Giant and it will be tonight. As Malenko and Guerrero go at it, the far side fans try their best to get noticed. They up the pace, Monkey flip reversal, Malenko stretches Eddie, they swap near falls, we get a brain buster from Dean, and Eddie gets distracted by six, and so Dean wins. Bobby and Mike join us for hour number two as they build the main event. We kick off with Super Kahlo and Conan. Kahlo messes up the end, but Conan wins with a deadweight suplex. Benoit and Woman arrive, the cripplers facing Jeff Jarrett. Look, Michaels come to ringside and fight over the briefcase. Mogo hits Benoit instead of Jarrett as Deborah shows the puppy dog eyes and Double J wins. Benoit again nails a post-match interview. He says Mongo's been fumbling the ball and Nancy's all women. No plastic or silicone. Arn says Flair wants it sorted and it's left up in the air. We get Billy Kidman and Scotty Riggs. Riggs wins after Kidman misses a 450. Tonight, unusually miscalling it as a shooting star press. Bagwell's out, he calls Riggs fat, he's buff, and they both run to the back. Lex Luger faces a debuting Nick Fuller, a decent looking big guy. Luger hits the rack for the win and the crowd go mad. He faces off in the aisle with a giant. Gene talks to the challenger and he cuts his best interview to date. Double A's out to face Rick Steiner, but the match ends in a count out with Arn going to the back to deal with the horseman. After the match, Scotty calls out the, the outsiders. He gets cut off by the truck, who cuts some music. The full NWO arrive for the main event. Hogan gets two to three minutes for an entrance with five to six minutes of airtime left. I wonder how this one's going to go. The bell sounds, Hogan goes to the outside. All the death dogs is promote Robin Hood, and we go off the air. Now, this bit is interesting because. We hit the end of the show at this point, but due to a deal with, uh, as we'll discuss in a bit, or during the show, they aired the rest of the Hogan and Giant match during the Robin Hood show that was premiering afterwards. Now, in theory, I think WCW understood it, that they were going to air it during the first two commercials, but it turns out they aired it two of the commercials. So WCW taped the, about five more minutes of Hogan and Giant, and they spliced it in to, for ready for Robin Hood, and then everyone else left. You were watching on TV, you saw the first one, and then you were given the impression that Hogan and Giant were having this 
40 minute long match and it didn't conclude until a long time in to Robin Hood so anyway we get to effectively the next hour of Nitro so during the first commercial of Robin Hood we cut back and it's your standard Hollywood phone in he gets his bandana shoved down his throat and we go back to Robin Hood second commercial cut in we return to see the giant in command he goes for a choke slam once twice the NWO run in the bell goes and we go off air and as Dell's note simply read at the end Christ you know I'm getting a lot of support but it's not about NWO it's not about WCW it's about two men Hulk Hogan and me, the Giant! A little while ago, somebody asked me, how bad do I want it? I want it real bad! Does it all. I want the World Heavyweight Championship. I no longer will I ever be a bookend. When I came to the NWO, I was a bookend. I kept the NWO together. I'm not a bookend anymore. The books are falling apart. And I've read every single one of the books. And tonight, I'm going to close the chapter on Hulkamania forever! So just taking a brief pause in the, the middle of the TV, he's the first kind of angle that I want to talk about here, it's a bit of a discussion point for the month just before we get to the clash itself, is this kind of ongoing stuff with, with Diamond Dallas Page and the NWO, it's kind of started really midway through the, the NWO run and there's been the, the full story with Page and where he stays, he's next to Bischoff, is he joining, is he no joining, Pete this kind of, this kind of bit of a, a twist again on the, the, the January 13th show where we get Page coming out in the the middle, it did almost seem as if he had joined and then we get the double turn at the at the end on the outsiders. Where do you see this paid stuff going and are you liking it so far? I'm loving it. I mean, originally, of course, the NWA was just filling up with bodies week after week after week and DDP was one of the guys who was hoping to be up against them and it looked like Bischoff with his friendship sort of behind the scenes was going to now DDP is an NWA member, so mm. to have this this angle on the 13th and this complete and utter turn and face almost against the NWA was 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 amazing, and the crowd absolutely went for it as well all the way. So totally. DDP, I think it's a great move. I think the crowd are behind him. NWA needs some competition. We've mentioned that on a few shows before that they've just been sort of really dominating the whole scenario. So no, it was a great angle, and uh, I'm looking forward to the future for it. Absolutely. No, fair point, Bob. What about you, Jink? I mean, we, we spoke about it at the tail end of last year where it's they had these big names and then it can attain a nosedive when you're talking about Wall Street and Scott Norton's. And do you think the page hang has helped give this, this NWO stuff a, a bit of credence with name value? Yeah, I mean, they were never going to be able to sustain it a lot longer without starting to build some, uh, some credible opposition. I mean, just imagine if they'd have put Page inside the group. Um, I mean, maybe it would have worked if you'd have been member four, five or six, maybe. Um, but just imagine if they'd have stuck him in along with Wall Street and Bubba and God knows who else that we, we've got to watch on this uh, on this pay-per-view coming up in part two. Um, as it was, you know, I mean, the, the, the rise of Paige over the last two years, probably, um, has probably been one of the biggest policies for the WCW and a guy that... You know, had had some things going for him, but his age isn't on his side. He doesn't have a great look, and didn't really have a. You know, he was very much a mid card heel, not going anywhere quickly. Um, and the last twelve months has really evolved and has really improved. Um, and yeah, as Pete says, we get to the angle. Um, I think that the, the the crowd was hot all night, so then popping big to the angle isn't inherently a sign that you know this was extra special. But I, Dad, I'd say this is the first time since the NW angle started that someone definitively got the win over them. Pretty much. I mean, we've seen we've seen these flashes of whether it's kind of one person getting the, the better than whether it was Eddie last month or Giant this month, as we'll come on to talk about a bit later. And you can see these flashes, but then ultimately it just ends with the NW getting the better of them. And this was a, as you say, a definitive almost kind of full stop if someone actually getting the better of them and it ends think, with them 
getting the better of them, Pete. I think it, I think it's the first time that um, Scott Hall and Kevin Nash have looked sort of like someone's got the one up on them mm. since the whole thing began. So they, they came out, that. They, they, they sort of came out all cocky, and you know, it's mm. all, this is all going our way, and suddenly, you know, a diamond cutter and Nash is out on the table, and it's like, what's happened? You know, this is this has turned completely f- fully around. So and it, and it makes sense as well because you see the two of them coming out, and Nash. I mean, he's always got that kind of look about him where he thinks he's too cool for school, but it yeah. does make sense in this angle where they come out, and it's almost as if we got him. We've got him, and it's you just kind of you just get caught in the back of that. And Paige is the move it sells over the the guys over the the crowds were definitely behind it. And I mean, it, it worked. I mean, it was just a a bit of punctuation, as I say, in that story with the NWO that we've kind of been lying so far because it's it's almost as if you always know the end before it comes. I mean, I'm sure there was probably a lot of folks seen this coming as well, but they've done it in a way where it it meant something. And as you say, the the image of Nash in the table at the ringside at the end of that just just kind of defined that defined that moment. I thought they'd done it really well. I agree with the twoies. Um, so I'm that is pretty big in, in WCW at the minute, really, as just general kind of faction warfare, whether there's like these gangs, whether it's the, the faces of fear in the Dungeon of Doom, whether it's the NWOs, obviously the big thing at the minute, but another, another thing that's been big this month, especially in January, has been the, the horsemen. Um, Bob, I'm going, to, I'm going to start with you in this one because this has been, again, similar to Paige. It's been going on for a good couple of months, the Phil Jarrett thing. I mean, we only need to go back a, a couple of months and it was a ringing endorsement for the Nature Boy with Jeff Jarrett and he was the, the second coming with the, the injury to Flair. It, it almost felt as if we were going to see Rick Flair transition into a, a James J. Dillon role and, and Flair was almost going to anoint Jarrett as the new Nature Boy, but that kind of took a bit of a stop, but we, we got another bit of a, another bit of a, a layer of the onion this month with Jarrett. What did you think with the, the Jarrett stuff and the, the horsemen in general then throw in Nancy and women and that full, that full kind of four or five people that we were getting on the stage? What did you think of that, Bob? Yeah, I mean, layer, layers and nuance are, are two things you and two words you wouldn't necessarily use to describe anything that a pro wrestling company would put on. And I'm not saying this is brilliant. I mean, it's not. Um, but it's it, it's really quite different to anything else we've seen in that they've managed to create believable and quite realistic dividing lines between a group of guys that are united, but in a way that doesn't feel forced or unnatural and in a way that is quite entertaining to watch. I mean, you've got... You know, I mean, there is the slightly weird thing that apparently is impossible to get all four of them in the same place at the same time, um, which in many ways does help the storyline, even though it doesn't make any sense. Um, but other than that, they managed to get, you know, you've got Benoit, who's got a rivalry with Mongo because Deborah and Woman are opposed. Uh, Benoit's got a rivalry with Jarrett because Jarrett's trying to force his way into the group. Mongo's got a rivalry with Jarrett because Deborah seems to be falling for Jarrett. You've got R. Anderson, who's there trying to hold the whole thing together, and Ric Flair, who's just really Ric Flair. Um, it's, it's very entertaining to watch. Um, you know, I like that, you know, they, they, they went from the Nitro where things were falling apart and we came back to the show we're going to get to um, in a bit um, on, uh, sorry, The Clash. Of course, we've got two TV shows we cover, coming up the cover. I like that they kind of said, yeah, we, we, we've ironed out our differences. You could tell they hadn't, but that was kind of a necessary plot to the story as well. Mm. But yeah, a, a really, you know, a, an unusually nuanced storyline um, that is intriguing, fun to watch, and I think it's got a lot of people tuned in. And one thing that Dave Meltzer said about WCW's business last year was a lot of the stuff regarding predominantly Flair and Savage, but the horseman kind of snowballed into that, was one of the big reasons why WCW's business held up in the first six months of last year. And I think when we talk about the reasons why WCW is successful, undeniably the NWO is a massive factor in that. Um, but I think just, uh, you know, Mongo is a is a, a recognised name. You've got Flair and Anderson, who are people that WCW long-term know who they are, and Benoit, who's exciting to watch, and Woman, who's been around a while as well. Just ticks a lot of boxes for me. I totally agree, to be honest, Bob. As you say, the, the components that's in this, there's a lot of trusted hands, and when you've got Flair and Anderson 
you know what you're going to get. But the way that Debra has come out for nowhere, Ben Watt just seems to get better every time you see him. Each week we live promos, and there's there's a lot of kind of different kind of sub parts to this, as you say, whether it's the the kind of the inbreed with the horsemen and kind of who's going in, who's going out. Is there definitively four? Four horsemen, or is it five, or is it three? At times, you, you just don't know. Pete, what did you, what did you think specifically of this, this kind of bit at the start of the month with the, um, the bit with the horsemen are out, and then Jarrett comes out of nowhere, Arlen seemingly gets the, gets the the rump end of this, and he walks out and Flair and Jarrett stay together. What did you make of this? Yeah, I think obviously it's looking like I think Bob made a great point about Flair being almost like the managerial role in the four horsemen, which has obviously never happened before, but. Anderson's kind of been the glue to keep it all together, but even he's getting a little bit like, what's going on? You know, you know, I think Deborah's cost her threw in a towel on one of the, one of the tapings, isn't she? On, on the tag team match and some confusion there, but I think you made a great point, Dale, regarding Benoit. I think he's going to be the one who, who gains the most out of this whole situation. Um, but Michael, if he can back it up in the ring, he's got a great character. He's a great addition to, to that. I think Deborah, I think Bob made a good point there as well. She's been, come out of completely nowhere and is sort of teasing almost dissension amongst them all, but then somehow does it almost to the camera and not to the group. So it's not causing, you know, almost face-to-face confrontation. So it's been a great little side story alongside, obviously, the, the NWO angle. And I think, you know, where's it going to lead to next is something to look forward to probably moving forward for us. So, no, I really enjoyed it. It's good. And then talking about where it's going to lead next, let's just get back to Bob and his TV decision. We get a hot open on January the 20th as we see Randy Savage for the first time in months running to the ring and doing a sit-in. He wants someone with a lot of stroke to come out. He says ex-boss Bischoff can kiss his ass and stays when they try to start the show. Chavo Guerrero tries to reason with him before getting frustrated. Savage gets up, strikes him and throws him out and sits back down. Opponent Max then comes out, easily 6 2 or 3, 280 300 pounds. Both he and the ref get the same. The locker room starts, the Quebecers, the Steiners, Sarish grabs a chair. Sting then drops from the rafters on a rope harness, which looks fantastic, and then comes to the ring with a bat. He strikes at the chair with the bat before nudging Savage with it as he gets up. He gives Macho the bat, the bats, and goes him into hitting him. Sarish declines and they leave together through the crowd. We get a replay of Masahiro Chono from last month beating on Jericho and joining the NWO. We officially open with Jericho beating Alex Wright. Next on NWO Sting and Scotty Riggs get the same time. Mark Bagwell and the NWO run in. Bagwell now going by the name Buff. They then make Dave Pence announce NWO Sting as the winner. We get a very random outside broadcast from Flair talking to the Blackhawks Rob Probert. Seeing as we're in Chicago, Mongo actually gets the reaction. But Michael and Arn up against Jarrett and Eddie Guerrero. Tony announces tonight's crowd as the biggest to see pro wrestling in Chicago in 1997. And not so well veiled reference to WrestleMania coming up. Hometown crowd or not, the reaction to every move from Mongo is unreal. The match ends when Jarrett is in a Boston crowd, but Deborah throws her sash in for Eddie and Jarrett for win. For its worth, Eddie ran, already ran off looking for six. Flair comes out suited to talk about the state of the horseman. Anderson chips in and Deborah gets white heat. Benoit says Mongo is a champion at football, but this is wrestling. Deborah says Nazi's got a fat ass as they leave. We get a bizarre dream sequence from the mind of Eric Bischoff, shot by a disinterested Miss Elizabeth in black and white as he lays on a Harley and recounts tales of his hero, Hollywood. Hollywood and how they begged Piper to stay away. It's not easy being king. Malenko and the Dragon go at it in amongst notable ECW chants. Ultimo Dragon retains, but they'll meet again at the Clash. Hour 2 starts with Giovanni in a Black Hawks jersey and Mike and Tony talking about Savage. Regal takes on a solo Jacques Rougeau. Another quick finish as Parker nails Jacques for a Regal DQ win. Sullivan's music plays and Benoit jumps in in the aisle. They brawl through the stands, get to the men's room. Jimmy Hart magically hides in a cubicle, poking his head out to encourage Sullivan. Doug Dillinger takes his second bump of the night as the woman starts lashing out with her shoes. Sullivan and Benoit trade pints in the aisle. They get to the ring and the match starts. They briefly brawl, Sullivan goes down. Benoit hits a highly race diving headbutt but lands on the ring bell. Sullivan was holding for the win. 
absolute right of a match very very similar to the one they had at the Great American Bash last year the NWO are out to allow reaction and take over the desk Carlo lays out for a second O Canada of the night Duncan cuts him off the Steiners has attacked Jacques on the outside and Hacksaw wins the Order then talk over last week's DDP double cross and Dave Taylor takes on Masahiro Chono Mass my hero as the NWO calls him wins with a step over toehold face lock Scott hauls out to a hero's reception to face Booker T Chicago is definitely NWO country Nick Patrick plays up the slow count and two sweet Scott Hall wins with an outsider edge or as he later calls it the outside edge for those cricket fans amongst us. We then get a new paid for promo for the new NWO hotline. Another tag split contest sees Stevie Ray take on Luger. Lex getting another victim in the rack. Hogan's out to close and even he gets some cheers. He poses and talk about his history with the Giant before security hold off Giant at ringside. I saw, I saw you with Brody Sick there. Sick We're on fire! Yeah. Woo! All right, Ric Flair, you've had an opportunity over the past couple of weeks to sit by and take a look at what's going on, your assessment of the four horsemen as they stand here tonight. Me, Gene, in a city that we should be tearing down tonight. I've got to tell it like it is. Nature Boy is on the men and putting his body back together so he can be a real life fighting horseman. But each week, I got to tell you, Mean Gene, I look at what's going on. I look at Mongo and Deborah. I look at Christopher and woman, oh woman, oh to marry me now. And then I look, and then I look in the eyes of the enforcer, and I get up here like I am, not quite as big as he is, but knowing that when I'm with him, I can walk anywhere. I'm gonna tell you right now, the horsemen are not the unit they've been in the past. Wow, wait a minute here, Rick Blair. That does that does Let not clarify that. When I'm with Arn Anderson and I'm with the old gang, I know that we take care of business before we start knocking the women down. It's been all turned around lately. So let me make a suggestion. Christopher, Mongo, let's be horsemen first. And then go downtown. This is a man's game. And in the world of professional sports, this is the greatest thing you could ever aspire to be. You honor it. You cherish it. If you are asked to be a horseman, you're at the pinnacle of your career. When I was down, you held it together. When you were down, I held it together. The fact is, the horsemen will endure as long as the names Slayer and Anderson are a part of it. All right, uh, Steve Mongo, McMichael, welcome home. Give me this mic. Chicago, Mongo's home! You know I've been a Super Bowl champion here. You all thought. And let me tell you one thing, you two. I'm proud to be a horseman, baby. So that's that, and this is this. That's right, Gene. I was your Mrs. Illinois, and I know what it takes to be a winner. And I'll tell you one thing. What they were doing to Jeff Jarrett is not what winners do. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, Benoit, and woman. There's no fact. There's, it's a fact, Mongo, that you are a winner when it comes to football. Deborah, you are a winner when it comes to beauty pageants. You're standing here with four other winners in pro wrestling. This is pro wrestling. Let's keep things in perspective. Well, brother, the fact is, we were up in that ring and had John down and out, unlike the last two times you wrestled him. So coming out of the, the January 20th, Bob, I'll start with you because you've just gloriously read through the, the review of the show. First thing, I, first thing I said to you after I watched this, watched this show for the, for the 20th is it's, it's possibly, the best, possibly the best live 
wrestling presentation I've seen on TV for for some time, and I think a lot of this is to do with that opening angle with Andy Savage coming back out of nowhere for a couple of months. What did you make of that? Um, to to back a little bit, I think just one of the reasons that it, it, it seems to be working right now is that WCW seem to have found a formula where two hours can work. Um, one thing they struggled with, funnily enough, around the time when the, the outsider stuff was going on, when they just moved to two hours, it didn't feel like they really worked out how to fill a two-hour show. Um, it feels like they finally got there, in part because they've got a lot of hot angles. In part, I think we're going to come on to, they're presenting shows in front of hot crowds. The so stuff that felt flat before just doesn't anymore. And in part because they can pull a rabbit out of the hat like Randy Savage, put him out there on television and for 10, 15 minutes and they were just at risk of losing people. I don't think they did. Um, I don't think it could have gone a lot longer. But a, a really, really effective and memorable Savage sitting. Um, and then a, what a fantastic visual of Sting rappelling down from the ceiling as well. Mm. And then all of the stuff, all the mystery regarding Sting and Savage walking off. We haven't seen Savage... Uh, since, uh, certainly not at the time of recording, um, and I don't think we're going to see him next week either. I might be wrong on that. Um, but Savage hasn't been seen, certainly on The Clash since, or on the pay-per-view, which is where I'm at in, um, in terms of what I've seen this month. Um, and that was a really good piece of mystery as well, in terms of what's going on there. But just a really effective segment. And, you know, I, as much as fans are there for... You know, wrestling to a point, I, mean, I think they're there for star power more than anything else, and as much as WCW might try and have us believe that Max and Chavo Guerrero was going to be the opening <laughs> match on a... <laughs> on the Nitro after the Royal Rumble, fucking hell, I mean, I, I'm full of praise for WCW, when it, like, we, we talk about WCW's lack of attention to detail, one thing I'm a real big fan of, whenever anything out of the ordinary happens the first thing Tony Schiavone says is well we're just looking for a replacement match because the thing that was going to happen now can't because this guy's been felled I love that small attention to detail um, but yeah the angle was really good it's good to see Savage back again it's a bit I mean you know in, in the last six months it feels like every major character in the WWF and WCW has had a significant attitude change barring perhaps Lex Luger it does feel a bit you know obvious that Savage comes out and he's pissed off because everyone else is pissed off um, but yeah it, it's it's more compelling than normal as, uh, as Bob says there Pete this was, the, this was the night after Royal Rumble I'm not as much an avid kind of observer and torch reader as Mr. Bamber, but I did kind of pick up some of that's just more than the back of how much I enjoyed the the January 20th show, but that's been the night after the Rumble, Raw was going to be live, they did almost, it seems as if they did maybe kind of hot shot this stuff with, with Savage coming out, Pete, but I thought they did it, I thought they did it brilliant, and that kind of start to the show really carried through the full, the full two hours for me, I don't know about you. Well, I think to sit there and then watch the beginning and then Savage just strolls out to the middle with a chair looking like he's actually going to, going to kill somebody where he was so furious and Savage is well known for, for that temper and that kind of fire, isn't he? But I think the comment for me, the, the stroke comment in, that, in the back was a bit lost on probably a lot of people maybe at that time, you know, regarding get somebody out here who I can mm -hmm. hey, talk about what, what I want and what I need and what's going on was probably a little bit maybe lost to, to a lot of the people there. But I think that the fans are just like, wow, you know, Randy Savage is out here and he's, you know, he's taking shit from nobody and it's all going to kick off now. And I think the Sting entrance was, as just Bob said, to behold coming down from the rafters, you know, literally straight on him and straight through. And it sort of stings this character that's kind of, you know, lost his way in terms of, you know, WCW and NWO. He's kind of his own man and Savage has walked out with him. We've not seen him since. So, where does it lead to? So they did a great job of having something, a real talking point and a reason to, to tune in. And also, moving forward, of course, what's happening now with, with Savage? Is he going to be you know, a, a sting ally? Is he going to be his own own man or what's happening? Because yeah, I think the sight of Doug Dillinger on his ass as well was quite, quite a comedy moment for me. <laughs> that, was, that was quite, you know, the head of security flat on his ass was great. And again, the crowd. I mean, I've... I've Spoke about it on the, the DDP segment. I think they just picked two arenas. Is it Wisconsin and is it New Orleans, I believe. Is that right for the tapings? I can't. I've got that right or wrong. Uh, uh, Chicago uh, was the 20th. Sorry, right? Chicago yeah. and 
was it Green Bay for the Breeders? Because I don't know. But Mike no, I think, I think it was. View. It was New Orleans. I New, think it was yeah. New Orleans on the 13th and Chicago on the 20th, I think. It just seemed to make it to me that much. You know, obviously, WCW is obviously clearly massively over right now, but the crowd just ate it up uh, amazingly. And it just made it seem even almost bigger than it was, maybe. But... No, I think Savage coming back could have been a bit dull, could have been a little bit, you know, Randy's back again, he's going to get battered by the NWO. Well, no, well, it's, especially, it's a different especially angle now, isn't it? Back, when you look back at where he was before he left, and obviously there's been these kind of rumblings in the last couple of months that we've touched on in the news about him. Is he going back to New York? Is he feeling as if he's kind of lost in the shuffle with this NWO stuff? And he came back and it's as if he'd never been away. They just they'd nailed the full angles. You see, that stuff with Sting, that's kind of vigilante kind of stuff that he's got going on where he's no WCW he's no NWO but then he does seem to be at least temporarily aligned with Savage there's a story in that the entrance looked amazing whether it was just the, the crowd or not I think that definitely set that crowd up for that night with thought what the hell is going on here because it looked amazing and then even when you're getting the likes of Mongo McMichael getting a reaction like that hometown crowd or not he, he was getting it he was kind of bringing the roof down the full show, I thought it was dead brilliant, but that that open is just as good as you're going to see, and especially when you're talking about coming off the back of a, a Royal Rumble in WWF, they absolutely nailed this. I, th- I think again, Dale, as well, the NWO are probably looking on, going, what's, you know, our dominance of, you know, we're creating the stories and we're dominating the shows. Other people now are starting to, to make their own headlines, and obviously they're all going to be opposing. So you've got sort of Sting, Savage... You've got obviously Luger, you've got DDP now, you've got the Steiners, you've got the Giant. You've now got a an assembly of, of pieces to a puzzle now that are going to oppose, you know, this, this faction. So from that exactly. point of view, it's, it's, been, it's, been, it's been great, the, a great start to the year in that sense. Exactly. And as we said in the, the first bit with Paige as well, it gives them name value and it gives you a, a genuine kind of counter-offer of what the NWO is putting on the table when it's just they're, they're, they're kind of beating everybody down. They're always winning. They didn't do it with Paige. Now they're not doing it with... They're not even getting involved in the Savage stuff because that was as hot as it was. When there's these kind of temporary alliances opening up, it does seem as if the NWO might be a bit shakier ground than they've been for the, the last couple of months. But, Bob, again, I'll hand back over to yourself. We'll run through the, the final week of TV before the Clash, and then we'll be back after that with a review of the Clash of the Champions 34. Well, we've already run through it, um, so yeah, but I do have a few things to say about this show. Um, sorry, but you, can, you can tell me and Dale probably cocked up a bit communication-wise before we came on air. Um, but yeah, the, the 23 would have would have preceded what we just discussed. Um, but I have a couple of other things to say about what happened on the 20th, namely, um, firstly, um, as, as Pete half referenced uh, where we were in uh, this month, uh, or this week, which was in Chicago, uh, the home of... Uh, or the uh, the prodigal home of Steve McMichael. Um, and really, when we talk about McMichael's benefits to the NWO, I think it's clear they've worked out or just realised that McMichael in the ring, they don't really have anything for. Like, you know, you could have put him with Benoit, which may have been the plan early on. I think it turned out they worked out Benoit so good, lumbering him with McMichael would probably ruin him. Um, but McMichael's role, therefore, now seems to be the manager of Deborah McMichael, who is... <laughs> Incredibly good to watch. Um, and also, when they're in Chicago, McMichael's really fucking over. And so, of course, we were here. And God bless Eddie Guerrero for, for working with Michael through some just about bearable spots for a few minutes while the crowd kind of got him out of their system. Um, I do kind of wonder whether they'd have been better set putting McMichael in a bigger match, but maybe I should be uh, careful what I wish for. And the other thing to speak about along Horseman lines as well, there would be the Sullivan and Benoit sort of match that we got on this show. Yes. Um, I think guilty a little, one of being very similar to the great match they had at the Great American Bash last year, and two to being very similar for the match they were going to have tomorrow night. In 24 hours time, yeah. Um, but yeah, you talk about a great show. This had a lot, and in front of a big, hot crowd... Um, you know, they did make reference on the show to, uh, you know, this is the this is the biggest crowd you're going to get for a, a, a major wrestling show here this year. In uh, in those all reference to the fact WrestleMania will also be in Chicago, but in a smaller building. Okay, um, but yeah, all in all, uh, just a really fun show with a lot going on. And they'll they'll pick apart any of that. 
Uh, pretty much, and as if that, if, if that wasn't enough, if you needed a cherry on top of that pie, you had Eric Bischoff laying in the back of a motorcycle, just as if there wasn't enough in the, the January 20th show. But everything you boys have said sums up, and I thought this was as good a, a good a live wrestling presentation as I've seen, certainly on free TV for a very long time, Bob. Um, I said to you, Al Fair, um, the closest thing I could think it kind of happened back to it was the ECW show for August 94 but when you bear in mind it's half the time plus it's already in the can and they can play about with it as much as they as much as they want or need this was just perfectly delivered and I say the crowd went a long way to, the crowd went a long way to help that um, but coming off the the TV for the month for the for the first time certainly this month we'll get the the review of the Clash of the Champions. This, as I say, adds Volume One. We do also have the pay per view coming up, Volume Two. But leading into the leading into the Clash, Clash of the Champions, thirty four. Bob, if you could just kick us off with the results, please. Yes, uh, Dean Malenko defeated the Ultimo Dragon to win the WCW Cruiserweight Championship. Scotty Riggs defeated Mike Enos. Team of Chris Jericho, Super Calo and Chavo Guerrero Jr. defeated Conan, La Parker and Mr. JL. Harlem Heat with Sister Sherry defeated the Renegade and Joe Gomez. Masahiro Chono defeated Alex Wright. Eddie Guerrero defeated Scott Norton. Chris Benoit with Woman defeated the Taskmaster with Jimmy Hart in a Falls Count Anywhere match. The Steiner Brothers, Rick and Scott, defeated the amazing French Canadians Jacques Rougeau and Carlo Lett with Conor Robert Parker. And in the main event, Lex Luger defeated Scott Hall by disqualification, Dill? Count out? What was wrong with it? The main event, I think it was it pulled disqualification, off, wasn't it? Yeah. Pulled off at the end when, yeah. the, when the NWO got in. There was a bit of leeway given, but they ended up calling it out. Uh, so it was a, a DQ win. Um, pretty decent show. I've not actually seen a clash for a good while. Now. They're not doing them as often with the the monthly pay-per-views and offer, but I thought it was a pretty decent show. Pete, would you make it us? Yeah, I think it was a decent show. I think actually it was a decent Nitro, if that makes sense. It was a very similar pattern, and I think it's probably the reasons why we don't have so many now. But no, it was a for what it was, and you know, a, a free a free show in that sense. I think it's really good, and I enjoyed it. Bob, probably yourself. Yeah, uh, in agreement with Pete, uh, this in many ways isn't a great show. In that compared to Nitro, it was, it was a bit flat. Um, but for a for a free two hour show, everything every segment had a purpose. Some of them were just let's just have a decent match. Other were more squash match related. Uh, things like that a little at the end. Um, but as a two hour show goes, this was much more structured than Nitro. Um, and yeah, it went by quite quickly. And I think all, all things considered, you know, for for WCW, it's rare that they don't get anything wrong. But I don't think they did on this show. So, Clash of the Champions 34, we kick off it's in the, the centre arena. My walk was going, so we've got Tony welcoming us. He's got Dusty, Dusty Rhodes and Bobby Heenan on the call. They run down the card. Benoit and Sullivan's got the, the Falls Count Anywhere match coming up. Paul and Luger's the main event. We've also got the return of Scott Steiner. Um, first up, it's Dean Malenko and the Ultimo Dragon. Mike Tenay joins us. Uh, Dragon has now just got the WCW Cruiserweight title. It's his name. He recently lost the... Uh, the J Crown that he won last month, the Jushin Liger in Japan earlier in the month. So this is just for the, the cruiserweight title. Uh, the two of them start off spreading a couple of hammer locks and body scissors. Joys of the Clash of Champions were then cut immediately to commercial when the NWO plugged their new hotline. Uh, Dean Malenko gets aggressive, gets Dragon in the corner. A brain buster gets a two. Dragon gets out of a head scissors, kicks the air out of Malenko, but Dragon starts getting his legs worked. Uh, Malenko gets in a great vine, half crab. Bit of a slow pace, but the crowd are definitely on side with Malenko. Uh, the two of them go to the outside. Malenko grabs uh, Dragon's left leg, puts it against the guardrail and kicks it. Uh, Malenko gets a figure four back in the ring. Dragon goes up top, but Malenko hits a superplex. Speed up a wee bit, trades some exchanges. Malenko gets a crossbody to the outside, gets whipped into the guardrail. Dragon hits an acai moon, so Team Malenko just about gets back in before the ten. Uh, he gets a top rope Frankensteiner for the Dragon, but the camera's cut away and we get an actual fight breaking out in the far side stairwell. Um, back in the ring, Malenko locks in a cloverleaf. Very, very good reaction for the crowd, and he is now the three-time Cruiserweight champion. Pete, the, the crowd absolutely loved him. Malenko in this, I thought. He was massively over, wasn't he, from start to finish. I think stemming from, you know, I think his, his work in the past sort of two or three months... In WCW, he's been you know, top notch. I know you're a big fan from his ECW days, Del. So you know he's he's bringing it bringing it here, isn't he? Basically, I love this match. I think it was a great start to to the show. I think it was with the crowd being 
literally anybody could have walked out and the crowd would have been hot. But these two started off, I think, quite right, slowish sort of pace, but they were building it and building it and building it. I think the end was, was really good when he almost blocked the uh, the kick into the cloverleaf and, and the win. So um, I think Malenko's justifiably now one of the, the top cruiserweights were now in the world, you know, because Ultimate Dragons, as you say, a J-Crown champion. And Malenko is the only now three-time champion. So I think... Yeah, you know, he's defining uh, that kind of division now, I think. So it was a, a good start. Um, probably, well, easy enough for me to say, probably match of the night. So that's me. Probably. Probably, Bob. Thoughts on the Yeah, at what point do you start asking whether this should stop being opening match fodder and should start actually appearing higher at the card? Um, we, we said it was, you know, in my notes I've put going to be a hot crowd all night. I think we, we found out as we went on through the night that wasn't necessarily mm. the case, which is... Actually, a good sign for these two that they're very much into both of them. Um, the match was predictably very, very good. Um, Malenko flattened out the crowd a little bit. I, I still think there's, I still think he, you know, this he needs to evolve this scientific style slightly. You know, when you've got the crowd invested, I wouldn't work hard to try and de-invest them, but it feels like he does sometimes for the sake of trying to get exactly what he's got planned in. Jake, it's a charisma issue, Bob. Um, I, I think we could dial in Jeff Parker and we could ask him for ten minutes what he thought of uh, <laughs> what he thinks of uh, Dean Malenko's lack of charisma. Go back to I think May, June, or August last year, and you'll hear uh, you'll, you'll hear that in full. Um, there is certainly a bit of that. Let's say that, um, but I think it's just also I just get the feeling he thinks he's still working in front of a Japanese crowd. Apparently, mm. shouldn't be that critical. He, he was involved in the best match of the night. He's clearly over to a point, but it's like. Stop fighting a crowd that wants to like you with a lot of really flat action in the middle. Um, there's also the thought that, you know, he's got to stop this thing where he'll work over a guy's legs for ages and the guy will have a comeback where he'll do a lot of springboardy stuff. Like, that needs to work on a bit as well. Uh, but a hot crowd, a really good match to watch. Um, and they pop big when Malenko locks in the Cloverleaf, which is another good sign because they recognise that was the finish. Uh, and it was the finish, and they pop big for the title change too. I just think, you know... At some point, WCW got to sit here and go, look, we, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. The best match on the show to be the first match, but it's happened, what, three or four times in the last it's, six, seven months. I'm going to be a few anyway. Yeah, but um, no, it's, it's a fair point. I mean, there is a bit of criticism in there, but as always, Bob, it's never unfounded. Um, it was about slow in the middle. That is the the reaction that Malenko's getting, especially when you say that is this always going to be an opener? Is it never going to get pushed up the card? I don't think he helps himself to an extent when when he is seemingly fighting a fighting a reaction that he's getting with the, the style that he's got, and it's a fair point you make as well when he is getting put in here with these faster guys that when he is kind of working on the psychology, working over body parts, if that's body parts that they're going to need to to get back in the hope spots, then it, it doesn't really help the overall the overall picture, but as as Pete said, it is probably the match of the night. Um, it did get good when the pace packed up. The, the reactions to, to Malenko was brilliant. It's just good to see him back with the, back with the belt again. Um, but if a quick, quick, quick thing for me, Dale. You know, if you look at the end of the night, watch it back again. The guy who sold the win the best was the referee. I think it was Mark Curtis. Mark Curtis. Mark, Absolutely. He's a, he's a to, his arms were going mental for the bell to be called. And just proper that, sold just it. That, that nobody, if anybody just listens to that show and never gets back to watch the action after it's, after it's happened, just go back and watch Mark Curtis because he will sell a move probably better than most wrestlers. Yeah. In it, any it, promotion. It's brilliant. <laughs> was that the ref down with last month? Was it the... Was it the main event of Starcade or the the giant or Luger match where someone was rallying and he was throwing like shadow punches in the corner? Was that is that Mark? That's Curtis? Mark Curtis. That's him. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Him. He's, um, every every punch you get, he jerks the head. Every big move you get, he's it's as if he's just seen his family be murdered. He, he's honestly the best seller. He's, yeah. he's my. He's clearly my second favourite referee at this moment in time, <laughs> which I'm sure we may touch on later in the evening. Um, but just in case there was any doubt about the, the crowd staying hot for the night next up, we've got Mike Hino, especially Scotty Riggs. Uh, but yeah, bit of enough match. They go to the outside very early. Riggs gets whipped into the apron. He knows hits a, a flying lariat. Um, a bit of a wasted by body drop to, to Mike Hino on the concrete no less, uh, literally 10 seconds later they're back in the ring and he knows he's on top um, he suplexes his rigs rigs pops up, forearm shots for, for Mike, he knows, gets a quick three before telling quote unquote Buffy 
i.e. Marcus Bagwell, that he sold out, but Riggs' soul is WCW. Um, Bob, much point to this? Well, the idea was, you know, we, we you know, we're, we're trying to build up Riggs and Bagwell as the, this, you know, big beef. I mean, I think they that they missed the point to begin with that nobody really cared about the American males. I mean, the American males were never really a thing beyond the, a weirdly catchy entrance theme. Um, and then, you know, they've got this rivalry to build up, which makes sense. They should do it. Um, and so the idea was, well, Bagwell's got a bit more behind him. One, in the sense that he's kind of seemingly got a new gimmick, and two, in the sense that he's joined the NWI, which by default gives you something. Um, but Mike Enos was a bad choice of opponent mm. when, it, when the idea was, let's give Scotty Riggs a squash match victory. Um, you know, as I say, there was, th- this wasn't bad. It was nowhere near long enough to get bad. Um, and the idea was there, just the wrong opponent for Riggs. I think Riggs might be a bit of a shot horse anyway, in that without the tag team, I don't know what he offers. Um, it might be worth trying to see if he can hang in the cruiserweight division, or whether he's up to the standards they're looking for, I don't know. Um, but yeah, just the wrong opponent. Pete, do you think much of this big beef for Big Boss? <laughs> um, no, not really. I think that as a showcase for, for Riggs beginning into his first kind of solo feud, it was a bit of a dud. And I think Bob's right. You know, Enos as, as, the, as the opponent to kind of do that was was a terrible choice on the night. And I, I did Buff obviously came out on the. Did he come out on the ramp? Was that on the night show? I kind of think that where I was now. Did he come out on the? That ramp point start posing. Uh, no, and that was the nitro. I think that, that was nitro. Just, sorry, purely Scotty Riggs like, talking to camera. That's the yeah. I think I, I mean, the, the the song. I think maybe that needs to go now to make it a bit more. Well, then also it's weirdly catchy. I can't agree with that, Bob. I'm sorry. It's just well, I, yeah. But if you get rid of the song, what's he got? I mean, at least <laughs> well, can, I don't you know. Clap along to the American males, but I know I know there's not two of them now. Um, just, but I'm, what what's Scotty wrong with it? Was Scotty Riggs not the theme song? True, and that's 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 the. I think you just made my uh, my argument what it is, isn't you? I suppose what it is. I just it has to happen because they're a tag team who split up, and he's in the NWA buff bag well. But you know, I don't see that going anywhere in particular, and I don't think it'll be a, a highlight for for Scotty Riggs to transition to anything else afterwards. So I think Buff's probably with the person they thought had more to offer out of the, the team. That's why he's he's where he is. So match yep. was. Pretty much a squash, was it really? To be fair, and I, and I'm not sure. Yeah, um, pretty much agree with two of you guys. Don't really want to spend much more time in it because I think we've gave them more than enough. Um, next up, we've got a, an interview on the stage. It's Minji, and he's bringing out the the Horseman Sands flair. Um, ben Watt tells us that they're going to dominate 1997, and he'll pretty much take anything of Sullivan's that he wants. As Nancy rubs his arm, um, Ben Watt says he's a Wolverine. He's going to take Sullivan's career. Arm backs up Benoit and asks him to finish off the, the rest of the carcass. Mongo just gets booed to bits. So, clearly Chicago was the place to be for the McMichael. Um, Cloud's back up when he talks about Benoit. Deb Rickett's in her digs at, at women saying that she is the queen of WCW and Nancy just looks like the queen of Sheba as if she's been dead for 2,000 years. Um, Pete, any thoughts on these horsemen promos? I mean, we spoke about it earlier on, but they did it again pretty well. Yeah, I think it carried on the, from a similar theme. I think it's just continuing on what they've already been working on. I love the way they always pan into Deborah at the end after everybody's done it <laughs> off. So she can have, she can have her little, uh, little digs at woman. Because I'm sure a woman would probably take her out, I'd imagine, if she needed to. Judging by what we've seen probably in the women past. I think would take out half the men, never mind. Well, that, that. Yeah, so I think Deborah's on thin ice, really. But I think that's, that's been great because she's got kind of this sort of cheeky southern drawl about her as well. And she actually comes and cracks away at her. And I think. Benoit, I think I've listened and obviously been on the show a few times where his promos now, he's, he looks, I mean, you know, he's the crippler, but he looks so dead serious. He's becoming, you know, mm-hmm. into that role. I think he's becoming more legitimate and he looks more comfortable out there. And he's so dead serious. He looks like he's going to literally just, you know, he's totally switched on at all times. So cool. that, that's been great for him, I think, moving for, for, for his development and what he's doing now. And dare I say, if you're sharing a, sharing a car with Arne Anderson and Ric Flair, something that's probably going to rub off and it certainly looks as if it has. Uh, Bob, the only other thing I want to talk about this is you brought it up earlier when we did speak about the, the Nitro angle. Um, it's quite hard to get all of these parts in at the same time, but the the Horseman just pretty much done a very solid interview segment and there was no Ric Flair there. Much to be said for that? Um... I mean, Anderson's pretty good, you know, tucked in behind fire promo-wise. Benoit's improvement's been dramatic. Um, Mongo's probably the worst promo of anyone there, um, which, you know, 
And he's not that bad. I mean, he's very kind of one-dimensional, but he's okay in the role he's in. Um, although, as I say, what what is he, in my notes? I kind of put, what is his role these days? He's not going to work. Just kind of there. Well, somebody's got the card in a briefcase, isn't they? I was going to say it's well, a briefcase. I suppose. Isn't it? <laughs> I, suppose. Um, I, I do feel for him when the inevitable happens, and when they, you know, because the 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 Deborah woman feud is going somewhere. I can't think it's for a match between those two. So very largely it'll be for a match between Benoit and Mongo. I feel a bit for Mongo when that match happens because I don't think he's going to want to try and hang around with Benoit for more than 10 minutes in the wrestling ring. I think he's um, going to have a painful more than after anyway. He will, and I, I would suspect that's where the whole storyline's going in that it will end up with the group will fracture, Benoit will challenge Mongo, Benoit will beat Mongo, and then Deborah will dub Mongo in favour of Jarrett, of all people, to try and go up against and defend her honour against woman, i.e. Jarrett against Benoit. Whether that's a great idea, I don't know. I still think Jarrett's a bit of a shot horse in that regard. Um, but yeah, the, the horse and stuff continues to be really good. I like the fact they said, yeah, we've gone away, we sorted it out. I mean, we know they haven't. Um, but at some point, you know, you can't just keep going on this road in a straight line. Um, and yeah, it, you know, a, a horse was segment without flair, and it's still pretty good. That's the they, carried, they carried it off. Um, back to the back to the action. We've got a six man tag with a bit of a, a Lucha Libre favour. Um, we've got Conan. La Parker and GL, they've gone up against Chavo Guerrero Jr., Super Carlo and Chris Jericho. Um, GL and Chavo start as if there was going to be a bit of a doubt that is pretty quick with the, the pairings that we get in this. There is tags on Light Lucha Libre, um, and after GL and Chavo, we get Conan and Super Carlo coming in. Um, Carlo's looking a lot smoother these days, in come with Parker and Jericho. Parker seems to have changed a bit for when he used to look like Skeletor and now seemingly looks a bit more like the Black Power Ranger but back to the action uh, Conan cuts off Jericho gets in, a, gets in a suicide dive and Conan and LaParker double team Chavo in a very very sick moonsault to, to Chavo who's on Conan's shoulders at this point Laparka almost lands in his head for about 8 to 10 feet in the air. Um, it gets a bit manic in the outside. Pretty much everyone, with the exception, obviously, of Conan, hit an individual, so um, dives to the outside. Jericho sets up GL for a, for a superplex, but instead sets up for a, a super Frankensteiner for the top. Gets huge height on it, and then the late draft in Jericho, and he gets the, he gets the win. Bob, it is, we kind of knew coming in it was going to be a bit of a car wreck, but do you think it was a good one or a bad one? Oh, um, good, just about. Um, I mean, you know, we, we've got Malenko fit looking like he's wrestling in front of a Japanese crowd, and then they start to think they're wrestling in front of a Mexican crowd. Um, I'm not sure either of them hit the mark in that respect. Um, yeah, it was too fast. I, I, I did, it, it, one line in my notes just literally says, slow down in all mm. caps. Because um, it was like, you know, it wasn't even it wasn't even me going. This was too crowded. You could tell the audience. I don't think could quite keep up with it. Um, you know, maybe they just thought, look, you know, let's just wrestle a, a trios type match here, and God knows they can all do it. Then I mean, um, was this between the fourth or the fifth suicide dive to the outside within about fifteen seconds. Yeah, yeah, a little bit like that, a little bit like that. Um, but yeah, uh, one thing. Um, speaking to Dan after our end of year awards, um, what was he kind of sent me his own list over um, largely in, in agreement with us but he didn't nominate Scott Hall so I'm a bit salty about that but a bit salty about you <laughs> as well um, but one, one of the things he mentioned in non-wrestling actually was Mike Tanay and, and none of us had, had put him forward okay. um, but, but Tanay is excellent um, you know I mean okay it's not you know Tanay is excellent in the sense that he's completely unlike anything else they've got and to an extent you know it's not necessarily inherently the sign of a great commentator if you're just really good at research. But Tanay is vital in these matches, particularly when you've got six guys wrestling really, really quickly in a style that doesn't really make any sense. He adds a lot of context to it. So, yeah, on balance, a positive match. I thought they should have slowed down, but the finish was very nice. But I kind of just thought the whole thing was a bit kind of vapid. Got to the end, it was like, well, you did a lot, but like none of it really... You know, I don't remember much from the match, even though a lot happened. That's never a great sign. Can't really argue with that that too much. Um, Pete, I think this was a bit of a prisoner to having, well, certainly five guys plus Conan, um, five guys that very much <laughs> want to kind of dive about the place. Conan just stands there because he's just cool and he's Conan. Um, do you think this was a bit of a prisoner to that? There was just too many people, not enough minutes. Yeah, I think so. I think this should have been the opening match in that sense, probably to get 
kind of things going. If it's going to be this high-paced, you know, spot fest kind of dive everywhere and no real storyline to the match, just literally just get everything out there as much as you can, guys, and we'll hit the finish and then we're out of there kind of thing. I mean, the Parker tried to kill himself, what, twice, I think. One of the, They gave it a good the, shot. I... It, it, I mean, blimey, that was quite scary. That second dive on his head to the, almost to the railing was, was uh, a spot to build. I just think, as you said there, Conan isn't Lucha Libre in the sense that he doesn't do the style. I know he's massive in, in Mexico and, you know... You know I think he's just massive in general. He's but. just... Yeah, exactly. And, and Jericho, for me, a little bit probably doesn't suit, you know, all that was going on around him. But I think, I think Bob's right. I think, you know, there was enough good stuff in there to make you sit back and go, yeah, I enjoyed that. But as you say, if they just slow down a little bit and let things happen more naturally... This would have been probably the match of a night in that sense. I think it was 12, 12 months ago that Conan was having to wrestle Sandman in ECW, so I think he'd take this over that any day of the week. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> Bless could him. be worse. He could have to fight Perry Aguero again. Oh. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Whatever that is. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I phrased him his last month in the TVs. Bob was uh, squeezing £10 and shit into a £5 bag. I think that was pretty much that. Um, they could few openers in it. There's there's the Ella Parker, Chavo, Super Carl. They can all they could all open a, open a night. They could all get the crowd off their feet a bit, or even kind of. Shouldn't this have been the opening match? That's what I, I think. think that's absolutely. The I mean, when you've got this kind of pace, you've got these kind of agility, agility moves, and kind of it, it's it's a good argument for being an opener. I mean, does it does it make that much of a difference to the show if you maybe swap this with the with the cruiserweight title, um, well, of all the point you'd probably put the cruiserweight title further down the show as well. You would well, think, you know, a, and with a title change as well, of course, it means a lot more, doesn't it? That match, exactly. so it should have been further down the card, anyway, shouldn't it? Really, it's definitely an argument. I think if you just swap over, swap over the two, maybe even push the the cruiserweight back that wee bit more. Obviously, you've got the the false count anywhere coming up, plus the main event as a free show. I certainly think there's a lot of credence to be said for maybe swapping these two over and just kind of get the... The crowd were already hot for Malenko before that started. This would just have made them hotter at the start. Then you've got the Malenko, the Malenko reaction to come later. It would just have maybe held the show a wee bit more. But let's say there was a lot of stuff in this. I think they, they, they tried to make the most of the minutes that they go. It was always going to be hard when you've got that many bodies in there. But as you say, it was it was just in the right side of good for me. Um I'm talking about tag matches, we've got another one coming up next. It's the Harlem Heat, Stevie Ray and Booker T with Sister Sherry, and they're going up against the, the oft-forgotten Renegade and Joe Gomez. Um, no messing about in this one, straight into the the next match. There was no intros in this. Dusty tells us, as only Dusty could, that Sherry's looking a little bit top-heavy this evening, just, just for a change, Dusty. Um, the Heat work over Gomez constantly. There's plenty of tags between Booker and Stevie. They get a a double suplex, Sherry gets a chop in on the outside for good measure. Uh, Booker misses a, a leg drop for the top, the Renegade tags in. Stevie Ray gets in to tag his brother. Renegade gets lapped with the Heat Seeker and that's that's pretty much it. Um, again, Pete, similar to the, similar to the match earlier with in Austin Riggs. Wasn't there really much to this, but thoughts in general, maybe particularly on the Harlem Heat? Um, I thought it was just literally a steamroller job from Harlem Heat from start to finish. I think going with it, the hot tag to Renegade was quite funny, I think, <laughs> to get him to come in <laughs> and then just get destroyed even more so by Harlem Heat. I think maybe, it, it, to use a, a horrible pun, it heats them back up a little bit, that, you know, a, big, a good squash win over at a tag team. They get to do all their signature stuff with little on their offence against them. doesn't harm them at all. So... I think that that's just just means they're they're back in the mix. Maybe they seem quite confident at the camera all the time, saying you know you know who's next, and what's happening now. So it was just a total squash match, though. Again, for me, it was literally just the domination. And God love them, the Renegade got about ten seconds and three of them were a pinfall. Um, yeah, Bob, would you make it up? It, maybe it's just wrestling in 1997, but I just love the idea that three years ago we'd have said, oh yeah, yeah, there's there's so much going on on the WCW television that I can have squash matches on clashes <laughs> rather than on their actual <laughs> weekly TV. Um, but that is kind of where I, yeah, it's fine. Um, you know, if you're, you're going to employ Joe Gomez and the Renegade, you know, this is the role for them, I think. Um, Renegade, you know, God forbid... 18 months, two years ago, the, the rise of the Renegade, that was a... <laughs> it's 
still trying to wipe from my memory. Thankfully, it's just about gone. Um, but yeah, what you're left with is, is nothing really of any note. I'm very surprised they haven't completely repackaged him if they're going to keep him around. Um, but yeah, the Hall of Heat, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's just nice to remind you that there's that they're around and they're a good team and they can win matches. And I did like the finisher, but that's about it. Pretty much in similar to the Riggs, you know, I think we've pretty much discussed other from there and there's not really much else to talk about. I'm just thankful that Sherry's away for, for Park and I think she's a bit better in the background these days and I said, God love Renegade for he got his paycheck, he got his pay he got his appearance on the on the clash. What? Sherry's Mate. outfit so Dale, what's going on there? Well Dare say we we saw her in the we saw her in the background, but dare I say we we kind of things going as they are these days with parent parent television councils I don't think she was leaving much to the imagination so maybe it's a bit for her. Maybe I think Bobby, bit... Bobby Heenan was going to literally lose his you know what at one point well but... dare I say there, there might have been a few a few pops for Ferry <laughs> on the night uh, but moving swiftly on we've got Massa Chono he's going up against Das Wonder Kid Alex Wright uh, Massa starts hot at right he's in the NWO he's going to be getting a bit of, a bit of heat in the match and um, he gets right in the corner we do have the the first appearance of Mr. Patrick for the evening. He's at ref and we's NWO shut and backwards cap. Uh, Wright gets in front with uh, an Insigiri. Couple of drop kicks, but he actually gets booed as he peacocks. Uh, Chono takes over, gets a bit of a warmer reception. Very much a note for the for the night carrying on for last night's Nitro with the, the NWO very much getting a warmer reception than they have recently. Um, there's a heel kick from, from Alex Wright. And Patrick gets in his, his 10 second two count. Um, an inverted atomic drop for Alex Wright. Again, Patrick then stretches it to about 15 seconds to count to two. And he just downright floats Bob. He floats the enforcement of this over the top rope ruin that we just absolutely love. He just dismisses it as, as Massa launches right to the outside. Uh, back in the ring, the Wonder Kid gets a, a long, a long, long quite a long two count um, and he actually kicks out at Patrick's knee and Bob to his eternal credit Nick Patrick ever the professional does not disqualify Alex Wright and counts nothing less than a perfectly timed three count for Massa Chono Bob Nick Patrick Yes, I mean, having seen Sold Out in its entirety between watching this show and recording this one, um, I, I'm a bit flatter on the Nick Patrick act than I was at the end of this uh, of this match itself, <laughs> but we'll come to that more um, when we record that show then. Um, Patrick in Small Burst is a riot. Um, I've got two lines in my notes that just read Nick Patrick, smiley face, and then again, Nick Patrick, <laughs> another smiley face. <laughs> Got when when he when he's using the right amount of time, he's really really good. Um, Alex Wright's really good. Chano's really good. Well, they're both pretty good. Um, 1997, they're still trying to pass off top rope being a DQ. I think we all stopped caring about three years ago. We all stopped caring when they stopped caring, and now they've started caring again. Um, I like that Wright ended up just kicking Patrick, and I like that Patrick just kind of wore it. And fuck me, that Chono kick on the end. I mean, they've got to get the camera angle right on that thing, but my God, that thing is great. Um, yeah, this was, I think, one, one interesting thing that WCW had to fight. I mean, I was going to make a comment on on the TVs and on the show about the lack of build-up for some, uh, for the pay-per-view, for the, the NWO pay-per-view. But it did kind of make sense. It doesn't, in theory, make sense in a in a WCW-led world that they would actively promote an NWO pay-per-view, even though, of course, it is WCW. So they had to tread a fine line. And this just about did that. I think it was just about, here's a reminder of the Nick Patrick stuff, etc., etc. In this In this amount of time, still really good. Pete, would you make it us? Well, I was a bit upset to backtrack in my notes, though. You missed the uh, the Public Enemy ad with the merchandise sales. I think you'll find after this match. We I think it was after this match as well, Pete. I was think. it? Have I missed that? Oh, my word. I apologise. Yeah, I think so. After this match, Mr. Kimber, as a, as a class of the Sorry, I'm afraid my bad. we'll be having a quick commercial break. I, I didn't think you'd miss that. Sorry, my apologies. Um, the match itself, I think you're right. The, the, I think it's the Yakuza kick. Is that right for Masachone? Yes. That looks like it's going to do some damage uh, moving forward. And you're right, Alex Wright, I think, has been... Very, very good and very consistent. I think for him up against, you know, because Masachono is a, a big name from from Japan. Mm. You know, I think for him to look 
credible against Chono. Nick Patrick, though, now sporting the NWA T-shirt, so there's no <laughs> doubt as to what's going on now from yeah the neck brace from previous and the shenanigans of old. I think he's he's a great character. Um, you might sound on a bit by the end of this. Oh, the next don't show. say Let's that, say Bob. That. Don't say that. Oh god. Anyway, well, for, the, for, for where we are now, um, I think he 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 makes uh, he makes everything just. I don't know. He just seems to to be able to. Yeah, even Master Chono almost outshadow and outshine him in that sense. But I think the right guy won on the night. I think it was a decent match, to be fair. I think it didn't look out of place. But yeah, they've think, done, they done yeah. all right. As you see, Nick Patrick, so far at this point as we are all in volume one, Nick Patrick has still a, a role model. He well, has over 30s that like to wear backwards baseball <laughs> caps. And uh, Alex Wright, uh, he's a bit cheesy. He's still young. He's a good looking boy. He's athletic. He's talented. I'm a bit worried if he's maybe fall a bit by the wayside, but fingers crossed. Um, and as Mr. Kimber alluded to, as, as a class of the Champions taping, we will be leaving for a brief moment for some commercials, but we will be back after these messages from our sponsors. <laughs> Yo, welcome to the Big Boy Shopping Network, and if we got a steal for you, that steal, you idiot, you last part, we got it, it's the Total Package Flex Loomer official t-shirt, it's strong, it's durable, it's 100% cotton, as you can see, it even holds up under the rack. Get your Lex Luger t-shirt for only $22. Just call 1-800-WCW-8661. You know what it's hot. You don't know how hot. So, back from commercial, we've got Eddie Guerrero going up against Flash Norton of the NWO strain. So, that's the kind of first real NWO chance of the night coming for for Scott Norton. Um, early on, he overpowers Eddie in a big bench press suplex for, for Norton. Eddie reverses his second attempt and starts working over the, the legs of Norton. Um, Eddie chops away at him, but pretty much gets no sold. Um, there's a big backhanded chop floors Eddie. Norton then gets a a stunning, almost one-hand, uh, one-handed vertical suplex, and then just drops Eddie for the sake of it. Um, there's a belly to belly, but no cover attempt. Gets another strong power bomb, but again, Norton delays the delays the cover. Um, Eddie uses this time, gets up to the second rope, hits a, a hurricane on it onto Norton, but misses the frog splash. And then get the arrival of Dallas Page. Um, Norton. Once she's Eddie into Nick Patrick, Page gets into the ring, hits a diamond cutter on Norton. Eddie then rolls Nick Patrick back into the ring, and the utter panic on Nick Patrick's face as Eddie hits the frog splash, and Nick Patrick just is forced to count the three is just outstanding. Um, Pete, we've spoken off about Nick Patrick so far, I think, but I never really saw um, Scott Norton in New Japan. This is this is pretty much the first time I've ever actually been. Kind of impressed with him here. I don't know about you. Yeah, I think the reason is that because with Eddie Guerrero, and I think the big man, little man, worked on this this occasion. I think obviously Eddie being a cruiserweight more so than a heavyweight um, actually made it work. And I think mean, Eddie did a lot of spots with with uh, Flash. I'm not quite sure where Flash comes from as a uh, as a moniker. Any, any ideas on that one? Uh, I certainly don't think it's because he's quick eyes. No, 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 no. Drawing blanks. <laughs> okay, I'll carry on. Um, oh, we'll leave it out. We'll leave it out. Nick Patrick in the end. I think that was that was brilliant. And now Bob souring it with the uh, sold out pay per view anyway for us anyway there. But uh, the match itself, I think, it's really good. It's good. It's strange to see the NWO for the first match of probably the night with them really involved from a, an in ring standpoint. But I think actually he showcased himself quite well in this match. Got Norton. I think Eddie Guerrero being the champion without the championship as well, um, and DDP just moving on from that angle on the 13th, coming out, hitting the diamond cutter. I mean, that move is going to be just gold dust, dare I say that, in that sense, to Diamond, uh, to Dallas Page moving forward. So um, I think it works quite well. It leads into Guerrero, into the uh, match against Six that sold out. So they had to keep Eddie over in that sense to go into that match. So, but yeah, good to get a win against NWA before he goes and does that one. Just going to write that one down for the 1997 Prediction League. The Diamond Cutter will, you know, homophobic tones from Southern Wrestling crowds. <laughs> Bob, would you make it us? Brilliant. I'll keep the, uh, yeah, keeping that on the predictions. Uh, to be technical, Pete, the, the first NWO involvement was with Masahiro Chono the match before. Oh, of um, course, sorry, yeah. 
Um, don't forget that. Uh, yeah, this was this was a really interesting match. Um, two very different guys. Guerrero's kind of on a mission to to, to try and prove that he's probably the best all round wrestler in the company. I wouldn't inherently disagree with that. Um, I think Benoit's probably better, but I don't know that there's, there's a guy capable of doing so much as Guerrero is. Um, an, an interesting choice of having Norton dominate a lot of the match to a point where, you know, I mean, it's much they're building for a, a Guerrero match at the weekend. He's never going to lose. But to the point where I thought, well, Norton just wins here. It wouldn't inherently be the worst thing in the world, but this obviously was a match designed set with Guerrero. Um, Norton's really quite good for a guy with size, certainly better than than your average big lump on the WCW roster. Um, the the ending was a bit strange in that Diamond Dallas Page started running out, and then there was a ref bump, which is a bit weird. They got that the wrong way round. Um, and then yes, uh, at this stage in the game, Patrick's reluctance counting the three was brilliant. Um, and this stage in the Patrick had a really good night. Let's say that um, really really good. Uh, decent match. The Diamond Dallas interference was a bit weird, given how they executed it, but otherwise fine. Um, I, I'm going to tell you I disagree with you, Bob. I thought the page stuff had its place. I thought it's done quite well, especially when they're kind of playing off the back of a single with him turning in the NWO. It makes sense for him to put there and kind of almost kind of do away with the NWO and kind of get these digs. What, what was he going to do without the ref bump? See, for me, it kind of worked because Page came out. And you never seen him af- until after that ref bump. So for me, it made perfect sense that he sees his opportunity, he takes it, and he makes the most of it. But there is that alternative angle when you've come in where, well, what if Nick Patrick stayed in the ring? Which didn't really make sense. But the way that it played out, I thought they'd done it pretty well. There was, there was a couple of bells, a couple of whistles in this, but as, as WCW often do, they never overplayed them. This time, I think how it worked. Eddie, Eddie's just Eddie. Um, as I said, Nat, uh, Norton just impressed me for probably the first time for seeing him come back to WCW. Um, as I say, he's really done well. The big man, little man, played off the the stuff with Patrick at this point is still good. And so I just it could have went into another throwaway match. So we've already had a couple of them the night, but they they done it really well. And I think it's good to get Eddie the one before the the pay per view. Norton done well. Pretty solid, pretty solid showing. Um, you know, it's funny, Hogan. I bet right now you're sitting at home. You're sitting there with your kids. You're sitting there with your family. You're talking to those other monkeys on the phone. Because you're trying to count how many lives you've got left. You four-legged feline. Do the math. You're thinking to yourself, if I used a life here, a life there, I barely got away from the giant last nitro. And luckily, all the security held me back. The security held me back. It took a mountain of them. It sold out. Nothing is going to hold me back, Hogan. You said you were my friend. You gave me the rides in the limos. I rode with you in the Learjet. The whole time, I wasn't your friend. I was the person that you were afraid of most. That's why you recruited me. That's why you paid me. And that's why you befriended me. Hogan, it doesn't work anymore. I have smartened up and I have seen the light. You know, when I think about your light, Hogan, and I think about your future in professional wrestling after sold out, you know what I think about it? I think it's real dim. It kind of reminds me of a match that struck. It provides a purpose. Maybe it gives a little warmth. Maybe a little inspiration, or maybe it just gets blown out. Sold out, you're getting blown out. Talking to all ones, we get a, a pre tape promo for the Giant, and it's another very, very good one uh, for the big man. He's building up the, the main event for the weekend that sold out. He says he's going to be the man to blow out the flame of Hollywood Hogan. And back into the, back into the arena, it's brawl time, and we get the Taskmaster at first. He does actually make it to the ring as opposed to last night, and we get a baseball slide for Chris Benoit, who he's going to be facing. They brawl straight into the fans straight away, as obviously a false count anywhere match. Sullivan's already sporting a, a shiner for last night's Nitro, and the crowds are just quite hot again as they get, to the, get into the lobby. Again, we go into the into the bathroom. Um, Sullivan grabs a paper towel dispenser, just launches it at Benoit's head. Jimmy Hart then gets a trash can launched at his head from Benoit, 
I think we're all pretty much team Chris for this point. Uh, Sullivan gets the first two counts on the bathroom floor as Tony takes great favour and telling us. And then um, Benoit gets thrown into the, the bathroom heater and they go back out into the the arena. And in the main hall itself, Benoit just gets thrown right down the stairway before they get back to ringside. Into the knee, they get a knee to the gut and a double stomp onto Benoit. gets a close count. Woman then gets into the ring, blasts Sullivan with a wooden chair, and it is enough for the three count. Just after the bell, Benoit gets another seat, cracks it right over Taxmaster's head, and Benoit and Woman make their way to the back. Uh, Peter spoke last month, I think it was, about Benoit's pretty much if I had to sum him up my word, it would be relentless, but I thought Kevin Sullivan more than kept up with him here, Pete. Yeah, I think actually, for, for what it was, it was um, quite an even contest, and a uh, uh, fool's cut anywhere, brawl straight to the back. There was nothing scientific or technical about this match, and, and nor should there have been in that sense. But um, the end for me just looked... It, I think Woman was very slow on her cue. It took a long time to get that chair into the right position to hit Sullivan. It seemed a bit... After all they'd gone through with mm. some, some of the bumps they took, the chair shot didn't really seem like it was enough really for to get the pin. Benoit's chair shot, yeah, absolutely would have been enough <laughs> to get to get the pin. But I didn't think that Woman's was particularly that strong to, you know, you could see Sullivan was looking around almost like, where are you? Are, are you going to hit me with this chair or what? And then I'll take the pin. But Benoit's took a nasty stumble down the down the middle of the uh, the stairs, coming on the way back into the ring. Mm. I know that looked quite nasty. I noticed um, you might have noticed Bobby Eaton was one of the guys in the crowd ushering the. Uh, the fans back as they were going around in the uh, in the crowd. Did you notice that? And uh, Doug Challenger again, how many paychecks? Yes, for the month. absolutely getting his paycheck. But I think it's just a continuation. Does this kind of the hinted in commentary? This is not over. Well, what's to come then? Because we've now had this match and we've had this feud that seems to be going on, and Benoit's getting the better of it. What's what's left now? Well, I mean, dare I say, bringing, bringing you in on this, Bob, again, kinda, I'm, not a, I'm not a big sheet reader. You kind of get a more, a more kind of thorough view of these on a month-to-month basis than I do. But, I mean, one of the one of the factors in this feud that WCW seem to be almost trying to play up is they're trying to get people to believe, understandably, given the angle that these guys are kind of shooting to an extent. I mean, we spoke earlier on about the horsemen kind of side of it more for like, the Benoit women kind of side and how they kind of intersperse with the McMichaels and double A things like that what do you make Bobby this kind of feud in general and then touching on what Pete's in there where are we going and the kind of torture observer shooting kind of side what do you, what do you make of all these factors well as we said in the news the, um, the the guys that seem to be working seem to be more based around people within WCW themselves rather mm. than anybody else um, you, you figured if they were trying to work the fans they might actually bother trying to explain to them that woman is was and still is married to Kevin Sullivan, which they haven't. Re- and, you know, I think by this point most people have worked it out, but it's hardly the greatest endorsement of a storyline. That's where they, that's how they got there. Um, as for the storyline, uh, yeah, I mean, it, if they'd have built it better, it'd probably mean more. Where it's going, I'm not really sure. Um, in the, you know, it seems like woman's with Benoit now. And Benoit's sort of the face, and Taskmaster don't really have anywhere to go. And to be honest, perhaps the reason they never brought it up is because no fucker would ever believe that Kevin Sullivan <laughs> could possibly be with woman. Perhaps why they put them. Perhaps why they never mentioned it because like that because it was so ridiculous nobody would ever buy it. Um, <laughs> but that's kind of the problem. You're like, yeah, woman's upgraded with Benoit. That's kind of the that 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 would be how I'm viewing it if I was just your only punter watching this. Um, this was a weird match. Uh, weird in the sense that one, they'd done it last year, but the same match up the same stairwell. Two, they'd done it last, last night. night. <laughs> I was going to say, not the, the same before, yeah. Up the same stairwell. And in both times, in let's surprise people that are around there, and as we saw last night, by the time they got into the toilet, so many fans had got into the mouth of the entrance that they could barely get out. And so tonight they decided, well, we're going to kind of ring fence this. So clearly they cleared the toilet and kind of barricaded the area around it, which was sort of reminiscent of WCW um, fake concession brown, uh, stand brawls of years gone by. I kind of understand why they did it. You've got Dusty Rhodes who's going nuts on commentary. You know, <laughs> for anything on commentary other than say, oh, for those ladies who've never seen one, that's a urinal. Thanks, <laughs> Dusty. Um, and yeah, they got all of that. And it was... 
you know, on, on its own, very good. But we, we we saw a really good version of this match last year. Let's try something a little bit different. It's like the, the, if you're willing to innovate to that degree, surely there are other completely different directions you can go in that feel a bit fresher. I've probably had enough of the Taskmaster Benoit toilet. Aye, I mean, I, I don't really still quite understand, given the way the the match on free TV, but then doing it the next night on free TV. Free TV. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, the, the feud itself, as, as we've said already in the, in the last couple of months, in the last couple of hours, with us, that's following one as well. Benoit is really evolving. I, I thought the, the takeaway for this for me, as I say, is just Sullivan. I thought he's been very, very solid in the ring. Um in this feud, I think, which ex- hasn't exactly been a mainstay in the last couple of years. Um, thankfully, it has stopped kind of painting on the eyebrows and getting away for the full. I think you could compare him to Dun- Dungeon of Doom days, Kevin yeah. Sullivan. I think we've come a long way from there, thank Aye. God. So so thankfully, he's got away for the, the master and kind of Kamala. the Zodiac. And, uh, thank- thankfully, that seems to be in the, the rear view for a wee while um, the only other thing I would say Bob I don't know what you think you're asking when you're saying about kind of the believability of Nancy Nancy and Kevin kind of being an item another kind of I mean I know I always go back to the black hats and the white hats but is there a bit of an issue here we try to believe that Benoit as much as I love him he is the good guy in this when he's essentially stole the other man's woman is that a bit of an issue yeah they haven't really thought the storyline through have they um I mean, it, it, it's it's kind of belligerently getting itself over in the sense that the brawls are so good, it's almost like the rest doesn't really matter. Um, but the rest kind of does matter in that this could be the best programme they've got, given the what they've set up. They've just completely forgotten to do anything around it that will give it any kind of context. Um, and Benoit's kind of a good guy, but kind of not. Taskmaster's... You know, a heel, but should be the victim in all of this, which is a bit weird. Um, it, in that sense, yeah, it doesn't really work at all, does it? Mm. But you, you mentioned um, Woman and Sullivan being in real life, and no one would believe it. Is it also as unbelievable that Woman and Benoit would be a couple? Because Woman must be how much older than Benoit at this stage? I mean, Woman's been around no, for a long what? time, hasn't she? She doesn't, she doesn't look it, though. No. And that's, well, that's the inherent point. I it's not so much about how old they are, it's the fact that Sullivan looks about 20 years older than woman. And then, all fairness, Nancy does look as if she puts her makeup on with a troll. So it is that way hard to see through that. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. kind of my point a little bit, I suppose. But yeah, I think it's not quite so bad the other way around, but I think it's it's a little bit tenuous to say the least. But I guess. I think if you polled enough WCW fans maybe on their hotline, I, I would suspect the, the guest age gap between Woman and, and Sullivan will be far bigger than the guest age gap yeah, between Woman and Benoit. That's true. Um, and so, just, yeah. as, just as we move on, love does work in mysterious ways, so I'm sure anyone out there <laughs> who looks as equally ridiculous as Kevin Sullivan and Tighty Whitey's, then there is hope for us all in there. But uh, moving on somewhat ungraciously, we're up with uh, the amazing... French Canadians who are amazing and the return of the Steiners which for the first time in a long time involves both Rick and Scott um, the, the Canadians are at the start with a just glorious rendition of old Canada but unfortunately the Steiners cut them off uh, the outsiders talk to the talk to the Steiners for two big screens at the at the entrance way winding up Rick and Scott as they as they walk to the ring Scotty builds and he's, he's blue oyster bar bouncer look as he's now seemingly wearing a black PVC singlet and a steel stud belt strap uh, the two of them start quick against the apparently the belt is in part to help his back um, you know you'd figure he'd just go for a weightlifting belt rather you would than have a, thought um, I dare I say probably Scott Scott Steiner should have a few weightlifting belts I would say yeah, well, he and looks the, like it, doesn't he? And <laughs> yeah, no, I think there's um, a few lying about. Uh, but yeah, th- there is there is a bit of practicality to an otherwise ridiculous looking belt. Um, but yeah, wait. I also wait. didn't think. Uh, speaking of the the intro, um, yeah, speaking of Scott Hall, I, I put most of the blame. You want to talk about Scott Hall, Bob? Scott Hall, Bob. Well, I was I was going to negatively score, but talk about Scott Hall, but but more much more so negatively talk about Kevin Nash. The the shouty. Um, a monitor, whatever you call it, the Shouty Tron promo didn't work. Um, they, they were trying there, but yeah, th- that was mainly on Nash. Hall was trying, mainly on Nash. 
Um, but yeah, I, I'd have come up with something better for that. Especially when they were all in the building. You would have thought it would have been quite easy to do a workaround on that. But but never mind. Um, can I go on with the, the match? The, the four of them start quick, but the, the Quebecers, the amazing French Canadians, they get an upper hand. Both Steiners hitting lariats for the for the top on the same turnbuckle. Rick gets a, a two count on Carl. Back for a break, Carl and Jock are kind of working over Rick in the corner, but they missed their, their corner electric chair spot. Um, Ricky hits a, a double clothesline. Scott gets a hot tag. Big back body drop on the Carl away. Um, press slam is Jock. Parker tries to get the, the flag into the ring, but Scott throws it out. Gets the pin in Carl away, and the Steiners are now back in business with a win. Uh, Bob, you happy to see Scott Steiner back? And just kind of looking in general, he does look big. Uh, yeah, um, injuries mean in theory a bit less cardio and a bit more time to. You know, I think it might have been a back injury. So I don't know exactly what he he could have done. Um, I'm not sure. All of it was was, was natural enhancement. Let's say that. Um, but he does look. Big, but yeah, it's great to see Scott back. Let's say that. Um, you know, Rick is a is a bit of a, you know, the, the the Steiners are both really good, but they are also better than some of their parts. Um, and so when you've got them in a tag team, it's a lot better. This match, I mean, you know, I, I guess you don't necessarily want three massively one sided squashes, but I thought they should have put the the amazing French Canadians away a little bit quicker than they even did. Um, but nicely Scott back, uh, right the finish, uh, yeah. Pete? Yeah, totally. I think it was a bit of a the Steiners getting their, their win back, wasn't it, from the, the uh, WWF a couple of years ago. Is that right, when the uh, Quebecers beat the Steiners? Is that correct? It would have been run about that time. <laughs> yeah, that so obviously, obviously get, getting their win back. Um, I think I think Bob's right. I think actually it could have been a lot quicker and uh, a bit more, more dominant for the, for the Steiners, but it's great to see them back. Scott <laughs> looks... Abnormally huge. <laughs> There'll be no Frankensteiners from that guy, I'd imagine, unless someone's going to want to kill themselves after he's finished it. Because how he's going to do it now, I don't know. Because his, his whole upper body just seems to be triple the size it was. You know, mm. how the bad back you've managed to do that. I think Bob's already made a, a comment there, so we'll probably, <laughs> we'll leave that where it lies. But good to see them back, and they are a credible challenge to the outsiders, which is good as well. So. And they've got the history and they've got the uh, you know, the matches in the past to back it up. So that's good news. That's that. I mean, we spoke earlier on about the, the Harlem Heat and kind of where do they go for you? The Steiners are there, the Harlem Heat's back. I mean, this, this tag division, did I say, if you look up north, it could certainly be a whole lot worse. But it's not been a big a big focus for the tag division in WCW for the for the NWO thing. Kind of took over a lot of the, a lot of the airtime. But not to take away for the... The match it is good seeing Rick and Scott back together, as Bob says, they are greater than the some of their parts, if not in mass, certainly in prestige. Um, hopefully the, the amazing French Canadians just get to finish their anthem the next time for me, because it's, it's glorious. Um, I don't know about you, Bob, but I've, I've started calling them the unrighteous brothers. Well, yeah, maybe if they learn the words... It, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. We can't, we can't hear that. What, 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 are the, what are the lyrics of the amazing French Canadians version of the National Art Theory? Just oh, well, Canada. Don't try and and flash that up, Bob. This is just, not a flashy production. Just uh, a, a series of drivel. Um, but yeah, at least, at least it's uh, a theory a way of getting a pop when people cut them off. Yeah, as I say, the, the tag team hasn't been a big focus in WCW. It could be a lot worse if you look up north, obviously. But it is good to see the the Steiners back together. I can only hope that the that the amazing French Canadians get to actually finish their, their anthem next time. Bob, I don't know about you, I've actually started calling them the Unrighteous Brothers. Well, I say, I don't know, maybe learnt the words, maybe that'd be a... No, 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 no. Don't all try right. and class this up, Bob. All right, all right. I guess it works. I don't know. Who cares what they, you know, like, they, they, they you know, yeah, move on. <laughs> are, are, we, are, we, are we looking forward to the Steiners against the Outsiders that sold out How in terms of that match? I better not comment, but um, Del, okay. at, at this point, I am. I yes. am. See, plus, as we said earlier on, we've got the, the Harlem Heat there. As I say, it's, it's good to have another kind of solid tag team in the, in the division. You've got the Outsiders, you've got the Steiners, you've got the Harlem Heat. It, it's hopefully going to be a bit of a better, a better pick up for these guys. And as I say, it's just good to see Scotty buying, Scotty buying action. But uh, moving on, it's now time for the main event, which. Apparently, Caesars with Scott Hall of the 
the NWO, the outsider, Scott Hall, against the Rack Master, who is now Lex Luger. Apparently, let's let's hope that one makes well, it on the, the, the preview billboard before they went to the advert break simply read, NWO Scott Hall challenges, quote, the Rack of yeah. Lex Luger. Mm. What was that all about? Just his Rack. Yeah. Let's insert your own Deborah McMichael jokes there. <laughs> um, but starting off, we've got the main event. We've got Lex out, we've got Scott Hall out. Scott is out with Nash and Six. Um, Luger gets uh, a noticeably lesser reaction in recent weeks, but again, with the, the NWO influence of the, the crowd so far the night, they do seem pretty split. Um, Luger flexes the picks and Hall flicks the pick. And Dusty Rose's jacket catches fire, apparently, in the, at the start of the match as well. Well, there was also that. There was also that. Um, the two of them sized each other up earlier on. Hall hits a, a throwaway slam, gets a bulldog for the second rope, and as I say, Nash and Six are out there cheering on for the, for the ringside position. Um, Luger hits a, a larry, it starts to take control, and Hall sells a, a choke slam onto Luger, and the commentators actually sell it really well. Um, it's a message directed to none other than the Giant. Um, with the choke slam there for Hall. Luger takes it six in the outside, but Nash manages to nail him as Hall, um, Scott Hall distracts everyone's second favourite referee, Mark Curtis. Um, Hall works over Luger's arms, and again, the commentators sell it pretty well, saying that Luger needs the, the arms for the torture rack. Um, another throwaway slam for Hall. Luger kicks it. Hall uses the, the ropes when a domino stretch, harking back to his days of big Scott Hall in the 80s. But Luger crotches him round the, the ring post before nailing not three, but four atomic drops. And, understandably, Hall struck one a little bit. Um, power slam for Lex. He signals for the, the pending arrival of the torture rack. Nash gets up onto the apron. Six gets press slammed onto him over the top rope but it gives Hall a bit of time to recover. Lex gets his 10-punch spot in, in the, the corner, but the numbers game gets the better of him. Eventually, after a, a bit of, kind of common sense with Mark Curtis, inevitably has to call for the for the disqualification. Um, as the bell goes, we get Rick and Scott out again to even up the, the numbers. The Steiners come out to back up Lex. The six of them go at it for a wee bit of time, but we fade to black, and it's somewhat unusually. The Steiners and Lex Luger standing tall before sold out. And that's where we cut off the broadcast. Um, Pete, first thoughts on the match itself? I think inevitably when we saw Scott Hall come out with Six and Nash, you knew mm. what was going to happen, sadly. Because I think Scott Hall, Lex Luger as a, a standalone match would have been a really, really good main event, more so than probably this was. But um, I, I just... Why isn't Lex Luger champion? I think we have, you've had this conversation before, haven't you? I think... Mm-hmm. I think the role he plays at the moment, and I think nobody sells better than Luger. I mean, the noises that he makes and the things that he does. <laughs> he likes I, a grunt. He does like a grunt, but he, at least he's selling what's going on in front of him. And I think, you know, the crowd, obviously, you know, and this, the rack is obviously a move that seems to be the move, doesn't it, in terms of the way that they're building it. And I think Luger, from a couple of years ago, lost in the shuffle and the Lex Express, etc. of where he is now, I mean, the guy is, you know, a, a huge commodity. And I think... I mean, we know Scott Hall, I think, here does, does some great work. I don't think he needed so much interference, but it was inevitable in the end. So, and it was a free to air um, main event, so it wasn't going to be probably, you know, quite as good as it could have been. But I think in general it was good. But the ending to see, again, WCW standing tall, I think was a good link in to sold out moving forward. Yep. Interesting um, bookmark, and as you say, it is free TV, but it, it did inevitably lead into a, a pay-per-view, and it's hard to kind of do that, especially when you've not got a TV interspersed between them to build up for the, for yeah. the, Tuesday, to the Tuesday to the weekend. Um, Bob, just before we, we kind of review the show itself, thoughts on the, the match itself, Hall Luger? Well, it does feel like they're in danger of, well, Lex Lugering Lex Luger on the basis <laughs> The WWF failed because they kept giving him wins and never giving him a title. And it feels like WCW are doing the same thing, um, which is a little bit concerning. Uh, when I started, what well, I remember, uh, the, the reason the, the ending didn't quite work was that they, they fucked up the time queue and the match finished early. So early that they started the brawl, the brawl then finished. And because it's TV, they just had to keep going. The brawl <laughs> started again. And then they fought them off, and then it kind of ended, and that's why that all came across a little bit weird. Um, yeah, I mean, just 
you know, think about how relevant this match would have been in WWF two years ago. A, a flat Luger against a, a flat Razor Ramon, or flat East Razor Ramon, you know, in, a, in mid-card hell. This wasn't great, not that it was meant to be any better. Um... Kevin Nash is a dreadful actor when he's trying to look cool. And Nash is great when he's just pissed off. But Nash on the outside trying to be all sarcastic and jokey and funny. No, Kevin, no, don't do that. Your your Corfax is plummeting. Don't do that. Um, and then the bit near the end didn't really work because Luger goes to launch six to the outside to Nash. And I can't quite work out whether Nash was meant to catch him or not. But he did a really bad job trying to catch him. It looked like a horrible fall. We didn't really see a great close-up of it. But it looked like Six just fell and Nash was in the wrong spot. But I don't know whether the idea was Luger was meant to launch Six onto Nash. But it made the follow-up very odd. In about 15 seconds later, Nash was in the ring attacking Luger. Um, and it was like, well, surely if... If Six was meant to have been caught by Nash, shouldn't they have both been down? But, you know, whatever. And then you've got the whole thing, and we've always had this problem with the NWR, and I think we always will, which is, it was fucking obvious that Nash and Six were going to get involved. So, how about the Steiners come out during the match when they can actually affect some change, rather than at the end when the match is already lost? I know they've just had a match, but it's just... Have some quality control. That's always the thought with that. It's an okay match. Decent-ish main event. Uh, I'd have been inclined to put Malenko on last. Uh, it's a free TV show. I don't think anyone would have minded. Or at least in the co-mains, you're desperate to have Hall and Luger as your, your main event. I'm sure in some degrees they are. Um, but yeah, um, I think this match... I, I felt like there should have been something on this match. Like if Luger wins, he gets a shot at Hogan. Something like that. And he obviously wouldn't have won. I suppose well, he might have... Tweet the finish a little bit, given that you won by DQ. But I felt like there should have been something on this match. As it was, it just felt like quite a flat match with a very, very signposted conclusion. I completely agree with you, Bob. There's just a quick step in there, Dale. Sorry. Regarding the match itself, the amount of interference that was going on, why is nobody in the back going, hang on a minute, we need to step in here? As you say, why didn't the Steiners come out at the beginning of the match? Or why didn't Dallas Page, rather than coming out in the Scott Norton match, come out in this match, distract maybe... Nash and Six to the back so that Luger and Hall can have the match with more to it. So it just doesn't, it didn't make a lot of sense, does it really? I think you're right. It just didn't, didn't work like that. Well, I mean, on that, on that note, Pete, thoughts on the show in general? I mean, there is obviously the discussions we've had over card order and kind of where it goes where and the kind of content and quality control that Bob Ollady did to. I mean, Pete, we think of the show overall on a market of 10, if you please. Yeah, well, I think it was, we said at the start, it was a, it was a good episode of Nitro. It was a free-to-air a free to air show. Um, and the opener was a match of the night. We said it, was, it should have been probably towards the end of the card. I enjoyed the six-man. I think Ben Wells and Sullivan did enough, you know, to keep the interest going there. The main event was good. So from that point of view, I'll give it a six out of ten. But I think there's probably been or will be better Nitros now than, than the Clash of Champions. So... That's 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 high praise for the current status of Nitro at the moment. So, well put, well put. Pete, six out of ten. Bob, put it yourself. Uh, seven out of ten from me. Uh, I thought as a, it was a very easy, very quick watch by WCW standards. So nothing um, objectionable to really, you know, a little bit, but nothing too bad. Um, and yeah, a ninety minute show that that, that largely flew by. Um, and yeah, seven out of ten. 7 out of 10, I'm going to split the difference, I'll go 6.5, um, we always kind of say this when we're looking at Clash of the Champions, but it shouldn't really be kind of measured on the same the same kind of scale as a pay-per-view, where it is free TV, as a shorter show, I think 6.5 is a pretty, pretty fair point for us to average it, at the end of the night, the, the first match is undoubtedly the best of the, the night, with a couple of squashes in the middle, we got Scott Steiner back, there was a good horseman promo in the in the middle, bit of a car wreck with a six man, and the the Sullivan Benoit was probably my favourite overall for entertainment wise out of the out of the show. I just like the way that they they can still do that that formula and it still kind of carries some weight. Um, the main event was a bit of a cluster with the the interference and the kind of almost telegram and what's going to be happening. But as I say, I thought it led into the the weekend's pay per view pretty well. So overall, I would say we're talking a six and a half on average for the, the Clash of the Champions 34. 
and that will pretty much bring us to a bring us to a close for this part two of January of nineteen ninety seven. It's volume two will be coming up after this, but first of all, Pete, thank you very much for joining us. Um, if you could just share your your online presence with the listeners and also plug your show. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm on the Twitter at, uh, at Pete Kimber one and I do a, well, it's a bit of, not a hiatus, but we've sort of scaled back a little bit. We do Card, Something to Change, the podcast, which does modern WWE and lots of British current wrestling as well, available on iTunes. Go and check it out if you can. And and Pete, you. Pete, also a very big fan of Michael Bublé. As, uh, <laughs> yes, I yes. I, I thought that was where you were going with that reference. I mean, I, I won't edit it out of this show because it makes I no sense. don't know what was going on there. Sorry about that. Some, my, my Pepsi Matt's gone wrong with me there somehow. So, some, something about the amazing French Canadians who were speaking about them singing, and you said, well, he's not a tenor. And then somehow, like, even in, even out of 20 years ago, it might make no sense. Then, like <laughs> Michael Bublé. Well, I tried so, to get the Zukov Nikolai Volkov reference when they used to do their stuff. And then for some no, reason, no. Michael Bublé came into my head. I, I, need, yeah, I, need to, so, I need to lie down in the dark room and word myself, don't I? Uh, no, that, that might be indicative of something, who knows? Oh, sorry, Dan. Seven, seven steps to Kevin Bacon turns into seven steps to Boris Zukov. <laughs> but I've really best of luck with that one playing at home. Please um, have you back on. <laughs> Bobby, it's nice to have you as, uh, Bobby, it's nice to have you as a guest as opposed to a host. Thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you for, st- for stepping in. We're going to see a bit more of this this year, just as we do a little bit more than, than last year, and it allows me to be a bit more flexible with my time and all the above. Uh, but yeah, very nice to uh, to appear and uh, on the, on this side of the fence and just chat um, chat some WCW. This was a you know it, it, it wasn't a great you know it wasn't a great clash, but it was it was it was good. It was fun and and yeah, from from my point of view, you can find me on Twitter at Bobby Bamber and uh, yeah, Patreon as well for those. Uh, for those wondering, you can, uh, if you'd like to, you know, say thank you for us uh, contributing your podcasting month. You can do so at patreon.com forward slash wrestling 20 rs Links on the website and in the podcast description. Uh, just to quickly correct, Al, this is technically volume two, part one, not part two, volume one. Uh, volume one uh, is the WWF show. But, Dell, I'll let you wrap all of that up. Thank you very much, Bob. As I say, that says volume two for January 1997. Do check out volume one, the WWF Royal Rumble in 1997. Volume three for your ECW, and we will also have part two. We've had the, the WCW part. We're now going to have the NWO part, which is going to be the pay-per-view sold out. And for the next time, this has been Del Muir, joined by Pete Camber and Bobby Bamba. Until the next time, goodbye.